All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, hey there, Charlene. Hi, Amos. How's Dallas? Uh, Dallas is okay. Okay. Um, nice, beautiful day today. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, welcome, everyone, to This is Crucial, our monthly podcast focused on healing justice and racial equity. Uh, special good evening uh, to those of you joining us from FPC Dallas, and good afternoon still uh, to our friends in Berkeley. Uh, we're back for another conversation that matters enough to make us uncomfortable. Uh, one note before we start that conversation, please do use the chat functions on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, to ask questions or just join the dialogue, or if you just want to say hello and uh, let us know that you're present. Uh, all those messages get back to us. And even if we don't get to them tonight, uh, they inform how we think about uh, future episodes of uh, This is Crucial. Uh, so we are listening. Um, Charlene, uh, please do introduce our extra special guest. I know, I'm so excited our about our episode today. Um, I mean, I want to start out by saying that I was just at a church picnic uh, with some folks from First Pres Berkeley who were saying, um, one individual in particular who was saying that she's so hungry for these conversations and that um, uh, a lot of people in her community are not, don't have the energy for these conversations because it is, and we've noted that it's hard and challenging. So that is not lost on us that sometimes at the end of this hour, uh, whether you're just participating by listening or participating by continuing the conversation that you might be tired or exhausted or uh, anxious or frustrated, um, which, and, and I think that our guest today is going to have a lot to say about that, but I do want to continue to encourage us to to exactly like Amos said, um, have conversations that matter and that are important. And so for First Pres Berkeley folks, our guest today, Shonda Ja, is a friend and a familiar face. To our Dallas folks who have yet to get to know Shonda, well, just get ready because you're going to become a huge, huge fan in under the span of an hour. Um, Shonda has worn and wears a number of different hats from pastor to preacher, consultant to community organizer, and an author working on their fifth book with the best title of a book that's ever been written I've ever heard before in my entire life. Y'all are about to hear it. Um, and so based upon that title today, we're talking about ancestors, our ancestors, those that have gone before us and those who have paved the road that we travel on, whether we are aware of it or not. And I think this conversation is a sacred reminder that our experiences, our struggles, our conflicts are not new. Obviously, we're seeing this um, across the seas in Ukraine right now, that while our struggles are current, they come with deep, deep, painful and beautiful and flawed and human histories. And so we want to delve into that today. So Shonda, if you would tell us a bit about your story, where you came from and who you come from. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this. I think it's a beautiful series. I love the fact that your churches are journeying together, um, along with other people who are excited enough about this to join uh, along in the journey. So thank you for doing it. Um, so my father was from West Bengal in India. Um, in, in fact, he was born into the state of Bengal before partition before colonization was over and um, lived through partition, lived through the British created famine during World War II. Uh, and my mother was born in uh, a small mining town outside of Glasgow, Scotland. Although if you ask her where she's from, she might tell you she's from this beautiful little island just off the coast because that was where her grandmother lived and that's her happy place um, where she spent all of her summers. So it's interesting because the landscape that shaped my parents is nothing like the landscape that shapes me. My father grew up in a very small, very poor village uh, that was incredibly remote. My mother grew up in post-war Britain, and I think we think we understand what post-war means in the U.S., but she 
she was 10 years old before they stopped using ration coupons. She was shaped by a culture where the adults around her said, follow what the government tells you, that's how we don't get blown up, right? And so for them to grow up in those landscapes means even though I haven't experienced war the way that my parents did in very different ways, haven't experienced famine, haven't experienced dire poverty, and yet those generational experiences actually make me who I am in some pretty important ways. I mentioned that not to say, look at how unique I am, but because I think that that's actually true of everybody. I suspect you two have some stories along those lines as well. I mean, yeah, I, I think that even in our pre-conversation about this, which was just so fun because from our very different kind of locations, we had so much in common just in terms of our con the conversation around ancestors. And Am Amos, I don't know about you, but I went and did some homework and talked to my parents um, in preparation for tonight about uh, the concept of ancestors. Um, uh, so I'll, I won't tell any of your story, but for mine, um, it's actually crazy because I have a really fascinating lineage, if you will, but I didn't learn it um, actually through my parents. I was sitting in the library at Princeton Theological Seminary when I went to seminary. And there was this like one little room in a certain, um, in the section of the library that was kind of had an Asian uh, decor motif and it was really quiet and relaxing. So I always tried to get a spot there. And I look on the wall and I see this picture that looks so familiar. I'm like, that picture is in my house. And yet it's at Princeton Theological Seminary. And it's um, uh, a picture of um, a, a white missionary, an American missionary and eight Korean men and one of whom was my great grandfather. And so the, the gentleman, the American gentleman in the picture is the missionary Presbyterian missionary Samuel Moffat. And my, my great grandfather was a, one of the first graduates of that Presbyterian seminary and the first moderator of the general assembly in Korea. And this was before it was North and South, before it was divided. And, and so, I didn't even know it wasn't like I was going into the family business at all. I had no idea about my ancestry in that regard. Um, I'd come to find, find out even more beautiful and fascinating things about how actually my great grandfather was the one who told the missionaries, it's actually time for you to go to your native land in order for Christianity to flourish here. It needs to be, it needs to become Korean. And I mean, obviously Christianity is flourishing in Korea, which is just a crazy concept to me. Um, and we'll get into this later, but I was talking to my parents recently and my mom, and she said, you know, uh, ancestor worship was really uh, frowned upon once there was a lot of conversions to Christianity because it was viewed as com competing or a sinful type of a thing to worshiping God. And so conversations around who your ancestors are, um, how you venerate them, how you respect them became like a really touchy area. Um, and so it's, it wasn't a conversation that, um, I don't know my like, you know, great, great, great grandfather. I don't know my lineage pretty much beyond my great grandfather. Um, but like you said, I, I feel in every story that I hear, I'm like, Oh, I bear a part of their story in mine. Yeah. Amos. <clears throat> yeah, we, um, <clears throat> our ancestors never disappear, you know, because the, our, our names are caught up uh, in their stories. And so where I'm from Ethiopia, uh, and especially the part of Ethiopia where I'm from, um, we trace our lineage back um, by uh, uh, like interlocking our names, right? So my last name's DeSasso, but um, even though we trace our lineage back through uh, like the, the, patri the, the male side of the family, all of the males and the generations above me had different names than DeSasso. So in other words, so my, my son's name in Ethiopia is Abraham Amos. Amos is my first name. Uh, Abraham is his given name. My name's Amos German. My father's name is German de Sasa. And then you get de Sasa Trua, Trua Bunea, Bunea Gopo, Gopo Wolde, Wolde Jato, Jato Chefi, Chefi Wanegi, Wanegi Bilo, Bilo Abilo. 
right? So Abraham's the 12th generation. So, um, so yeah, it's, um, uh, there's also like physical landmarks that are in our village. We know from Abote Chefi, which is, uh, I guess that would be Abote being, uh, in Abote Chefi, sorry, uh, that still carry the names of, of all of these forefathers. So uh, I'll tell you about one uh, big, huge tropical tree that's above our home in Abote where we're from. It's called Giltugopa, that's right? So Oak of Gopo and um, is, is how, how you translate it. Uh, that tree was planted on the grave of uh, Abo Gopo, um, so one of the people that I just named. Um, and then you get like the source of the stream that's in our village. It is uh, in Abote. It's called Lega Gopo, so that would be like Gopo River. Um, and it's not like these names were given by like you know the provincial government or you know the mun local municipality. These are just names that our family ascribed to this to this river, right? Um, so anyway, uh, we trace our like trip. We, we we every time I say my name, I'm actually recalling the names of you know all of our ancestors. And so, uh, and I think it's um, it, it's it's a trip because uh, my birth certificate um, when I was born, um, uh, it's uh, if you look at it now, like it's got marks. It's marked up with whiteout. Things have been crossed out on it. I mean. There's letters in my name that have white out on them. And then my dad just wrote different letters on there, you know? So uh, the, the written history is not as, um, it's, uh, it's not as, um, as significant for us as the oral history, you know? So that's the part that matters uh, for us. And um, so our history is, is, is oral. Our ancestors are kept alive by the stories we tell them about them, right? There's no like objective set of, you know, uh, like book of information where you would go um, to hear the stories of your ancestors. We keep keep them alive. Number one by saying our name every single time, and then number two by telling telling stories about them. Well, and I think that that's a really important point because I think the stories about our ancestors tell us a lot about who we're being invited to be, what we're being invited to value, what we're being invited to prioritize. Um, there's a story that my family tells a lot about my great, great grandmother. And she, she was widowed early. She had one son and who was supposed to inherit the land because patriarchy is, is a thing. Oh, let me say patriarchy was a thing. Thank goodness we got rid of it. Uh, but back then patriarchy was a thing. And so she didn't have any rights to the land. Her son was going to receive it. And somebody in the village poisoned her son, killed her son. I've seen pictures of her with her eyes clouded over. And the story that my family tells is she cried herself blind for love of her son. And the reason that story matters so much to me is because it's my family saying, here's what a mother's love looks like. Here's what, it, and really mother's love is considered the most sacred form of love. Not just in our family, there's a cultural and a religious element to that, uh, that's certainly uh, saturated into Hinduism, which is what my family in India practices. And so there's something remarkable about the fact that that is clearly the narrative that is being passed down when that story, whenever that story gets told. There are other things going on in that story. It could have been a story about the injustices of patriarchy, right? It could have been a story about how the notion of property as something that people can own will kill us right? There are multiple narratives we could get from that story. The story my family tells is she cried herself blind for love of her son. Um, and I think that that's interesting because I don't know that we always go back and exegete our family stories in the way that you all, as good Presbyterians, exegete the scripture. Uh, but it's something we can do and maybe uh, maybe should do. I mean, yeah, it's what everything you just explained sounded like 
biblical, scriptural, how we go back to the text, how we, um, there are so many different angles and facets, um, and how we retain those stories. I'm thinking about recently my, the seminary I went to is, is stripping the name of the chapel because I mean, in, in our last conversation, um, one of our, uh, wonderful guests and amazing members at Dallas was talking about his own, um, heritage and ancestry as it relates to the KKK. And so as we move forward in this, how do we talk about our ancestors um, in a way that we retain them honestly? Um, what is the role of erasing histories? Or, I mean, it's just, it's all, it's a, it's a complicated conversation. I mean, the and ancestors are the entree point. Um, but I'm curious about that. And honestly, like, why are you writing a bit? And please, can you share your title already? It's the best title, please. I gotta say, I got special permission. I literally, just before we got on, uh, texted my publisher. And despite the fact that he's supposed to be taking the Sabbath off, he texted me back and said, with this particular audience, okay, you can tell them the title. It's been embargoed up till this point. This is the first public audience that's hearing it. The book is called rebels, despots, and saints, the ancestors who free us and the ancestors we need to free. And I think part of why I wanted to embark on this, there was, there was a very kind of cockeyed optimistic reason I wrote this book, which is um, most of us come from the 99%. If we hear the stories of the regular people that we're from, it can help us realize our own power. That was very much where I was coming from. I was watching activists burn out because they didn't have a spiritual core, but the activists in Oakland who are thriving tend to be the ones with ancestral practices built into their community organizing strategies and even into their, you know, uh, their uh, rallies and protests and all of that. I was also very aware that I worked with a religious community that is very anxious and tepid about doing what I think is a biblical mandate of justice. And I think that paying attention to the stories of our ancestors can give us the courage to do what is right, even at risk to ourselves, because that's what many of our ancestors did. And then I came across the hiccup. I can see on your faces, you already know. You wouldn't have started on this project, uh, at least the way I did, because you'd be like, yeah, but. Um, and I stumbled upon the yeah, but while I was doing the research. Um, and the yeah, but is some of us have pretty awful ancestors. What do we do with that, right? Um, if I love, I love that, um, that your congregant had the courage to share that very vulnerable story. Um, it's such a model for us. And it reminded me uh, very much of their, some of us have heard of Dred Scott, the, the man who liberated himself, who found a path out of enslavement and his family. And when his enslavers demanded he be re-enslaved, he went to the court and said, no, legally, here's why I'm allowed to be free. Um, here's why I'm protected. Here's how the law protects me. Um, it wasn't even just the moral case of no human being should be owned, but an actual court argument. And he lost the case. It's, it's frequently, I mean, everybody who studies the law knows this case as an example of how our justice system can fail. It's the primary example of how our justice system, when following all the rules, can still fail. Um, and some people would say was designed to fail, but if what I'm not trying to make that argument right now. Um, but what I do wanna say is, so Dred Scott's descendants um, are still here and thriving. And so are the descendants of Roger Taney, the Supreme Court justice who determined Dred Scott needed to be, to remain enslaved. The families, the descendants of both of those men have been meeting for years, pursuing a path of reparations, restoration, reconciliation, 
not just one, but all of those things. What's fascinating is if you listen to some of the descendants of Dred Scott, they're like, these are good guys. They're doing their best. We don't really need more from them than the fact that they're aware of it. Whereas Judge Taney's uh, uh, descendants are like, no, no, this is not enough. We've got to figure out how to make it right. They, there's a, there's a statue to Taney and uh, the, fa- the descendants of his family, they had conversation with the descendants of Dred Scott and said, what if we put up a statue of Dred Scott opposite that statue so that we force a conversation so that they finally, as ancestors, confront each other and cause us to be in dialogue. And before they could move on that, the activists who, and I am very thrilled that the activists have been taking down the statues of of enslavers, of people who propped up enslavement, um, but the statue was taken down before they could do that. But I think what they were doing invites us to wrestle with some really important questions. What do we do with ancestors who caused harm? I don't know if y'all have had any chances to think about that for yourselves. I'd love to hear. And I didn't mean to spring that one on you because that one's really deep. And I've been thinking about it for four years before I came up with an answer. So please, Amos, jump in. I would, I mean, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, it's, uh, um, we rewrite stories, you know, I mean, I don't want to romanticize, right, this kind of oral tradition that, that we, that, um, that we practice in my culture, but I mean, it's, um, uh, whoever the story, there's a lot of power in, like, holding the narrative and getting to tell the story, right, having, being in a position um, to articulate somebody else's story, your ancestor's story, so, um, and, yeah, I've, uh, I mean, I've witnessed even, like, with, extended family um uh in in uh um that we have you know we have we've written out or adjusted parts that aren't very comfortable you know for us to hear that don't uh that don't align with um uh, our own mythology you know um and so uh and it's um uh, to resist that is really hard because internally, like the in one, the internal mechanism, right, that sort of controls these relationships, is 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 very definitive. Like it's fixed. It's just it's difficult to go in and like ask questions of a culture in which, number one, you nobody asks those questions, and so when you ask them, everybody's like, "Why are you even talking? Like, why are you talking about this?" You know. <laughs> Um, there's zero, I've, I've experienced them, little interest in, um, in re-examining or re-interrogating, um, you know, the stories of our ancestors, um, when they're not, you know, uh, when they don't match or align with our mythology, just, just not there. Um, so, and yet we're actually always interrogating and re-examining the stories. It's just like certain people get to do it you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) certain people get to be editor um, and it's not everybody gets that opportunity or that chance. That's what I would say. We just rewrite them when they don't, when we don't like them, just tell a different story. I mean, and I, I remember you saying this about Ethiopian culture and the same as of Korean culture. And I imagine Indian culture as well. Um, the, the ancestry is traced all, it's all patrilineal, right? And so um, in Chusak holiday in Korean culture, you lay out, for Chesa, you lay out food um, for your ancestors, but it's always on the male side. So if I were to get married to someone, I essentially say goodbye to my ancestors, you know, on my birth side and marry into a different lineage. And so um, that's obviously going to limit. So not only is there the narratives that we're trying to maintain, then there's the patriarchy in which it's like the system in which the stories get passed down. But I mean, we're in an unprecedented time right now where, um, I mean, with social media, we don't get to control our narratives or forget them as easily as our parents did, right? Like I, there isn't a, 
there isn't a, you know, a virtual trail of my great grandfather of all the amazing things he did or those times that he popped off on Twitter. And all of a sudden, 10 years later, that opinion's not so cool anymore. Right. Like you said, Amos, like we just remember these stories that we want to. Um, and so it'll be interesting. A, has the ancestry game changed? Like, will I actually be honored as someone's ancestor or is information just so are we so inundated with all of these? Like, I mean, like, you know, several generations from now, is someone going to pull my Instagram account? Am I going to be judged on that? Or am I serve? You know, it's just, it is a different game. And how does that impact yeah. how we relate to our futures? In our past. Or in our past. Yeah. I, I'm I so, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I'm, I'm so, I know there's, deep sexism in Korean culture. There's no way that that wasn't at play in the generations of my great, my grandfather, great grandfather, all that kind of stuff. Um, I just, like you said, those stories aren't being told. So I, I actually don't have the, the material by which to be critical. So this is something that this is part of why I ended up structuring the book the way I did was the first three chapters are on embarrassing ancestors, which is not actually what you think it is. I'll come back to that. Atrocious ancestors and overlooked and over romanticized ancestors. And it's interesting because as I've been doing this research and having these conversations, I've realized, and I thought I was not surprised to hear this come up. I did, I did a, I did wisdom circles with people of color and I did wisdom circles with white people. I was not surprised to hear this surface in the white people wisdom circles, but it turns out it was true in both circles. Many of us have ancestors whose stories we haven't been told because they were disruptive. And so within, within dominant culture, and I think you, you all have been having enough conversations about race that I can use some shorthand here and say, whiteness was very intentionally constructed as a racial category about 400 years ago in very particular ways in the US, in what is now the US, um, that in many ways erased people's ancestries and cultures and distinct self-understandings and replaced it with a white culture um, that was, again, a synthetic thing, a a, an intentionally created thing, um, which includes a sense of, because we are on top, because white people are on top, they, um, they aren't disruptive to the status quo. There are ways in which they're allowed to be, but by and large, good citizens, well-behaved people is the desired um, behavior pattern. Even in places like Berkeley or Texas, where the stories of the radicals fighting against the oppressive left or right or whatever it is, um, are part of the story. There's also very much a culture of don't rock the boat, um, don't stick out, uh, be polite, be normal. Be normal, I think is actually the right, the right phrase. So I wasn't surprised to hear that show up in, um, in the white wisdom circle because so many people had lost these amazing stories of people who had challenged evil, um, who had stood up against harm because even telling those stories meant they stuck out. And that wasn't American, it wasn't Midwestern, it wasn't white. Um, turns out because so many of, of our people of color communities have experienced colonization or um, forced, uh, have been forced into uh, immigration, have had to cultivate survival techniques the same thing happened among a lot of the people of color I talked with, which is uh, there were ancestors who were deemed embarrassing because they didn't fit into a norm because it would have meant we would have stuck out. Um, and so I think there's something interesting about the fact that for very different reasons, um, all of us 
may have some ancestors that we have to do some digging around to hear about because they were unusual and nothing more than unusual. They held on to ancestral pra healing practices. They stood up against the Confederacy when they lived in a Southern town, whatever it is. Um, we sometimes lose great stories because they disrupt us being invisible and safe. Amos. What happens if we don't reclaim it? What, what if we're just like, yeah, you know, I'm good. I uh, don't need to know anything more about, you know, my ancestors. I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm actually working on in the future to rewrite, like in, in the work I do, I'm trying to establish a completely different narrative for my family name, you know? Yeah. Uh, who, what do you say to, to those of us? And I would I, I acknowledge that I'm probably there. There are times when when I make decisions and choices about like my own life, just to spite, you know, my ancestors. Right. Or the story that not that the story that I've been handed about who I'm supposed to be because yeah. I'm a disaster. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so I'll say two things, uh, one of which is if you don't want to connect with your ancestors, that's fine. I'm not here, you know, I'm a lousy evangelist. There are people who told me I shouldn't go into ministry for that reason. I'm not here to convince anybody of anything, but for those of us who are longing for a sense of connection in a world, and it's interesting because I think it's a different challenge for different people. Um, I think the American ethos and it's incredibly toxic evil of individualism has caused us to be so isolated from anyone, from each other, from our past, from any sense of connection, um, that I think that's part of what mo motivated this, because I do most of my work in this country, um, and it is such a toxic sludge that we don't even realize is flowing through our veins not that long after we've come here. In fact, we've been trained to think it's a good thing. That's how, that's how insidious it is. Um, that said, for those of us who come from um, strong senses of our ancestors, and with that comes a, here's what you are obligated to do as a result. Um, there's, a, there's a catchphrase, a catchphrase, there's a saying, in, and I think it's all across India, because I saw it, saw it at a Punjabi restaurant, but it certainly has destroyed lives in my own Bengali family, um, which is, but what will people say? For that to shape generations uh, is also a problem of equal heft, right? And I think that's what you're talking about, which is here's what you are required to be because of your lineage. I think in those moments, and this is where, so the first third of my book is about biological ancestors to some extent. The middle portion is so do we have a right to claim other ancestors? What does it mean to claim cultural ancestors? Because when I discovered, oh, being Indian doesn't just mean being well-behaved and staying out of trouble and um, being acceptable to white people, being Indian can be about, and not just Indian, Bengali, my own people. We were radical disruptors. We stood, we had a key role in dismantling uh, colonialism. That's not the story I was raised with, but it turns out I've got this cultural narrative so that I'm not alone in being the kind of person I am. It turns out there are people who came before me. It's much less lonely. Um, and we are actually social beings, except those of us who are malformed and isolationist. Um, and I will pray for all of you who are like, don't need anybody, um, but most of us, and this is why we're in church, our social beings, we need that connection. And I think the biological ancestors are certainly not the only ones that uh, we can turn to if we're experiencing that sense of this notion of biology being destiny is also a dangerous thing. I still appreciate um, you naming the individualism piece that is just rampant in our, uh, our culture in our context. Um, and I think how that's contributing to uh, why these conversations are so challenging and exhausting and dangerous, honestly. I mean, a lot of what some of the pain I'm hearing within my own community is 
Um, you know, I mean, I, I think Hank would be a perfect example of Hank wasn't in the KKK, right? And so, and yet um, there is like rhetoric now that's just about shame. And I think it, I think, you know, like, well, if it's in your history, you like white people bear that all of that shame, even if you're not racist or you're, you are not in the KKK, it is in your lineage, you know, like you hold responsibility, blah, 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 blah. Um, and there's pain around that for a lot of people who in these, um, in this kind of discourse, just constantly feel um, accused or berated. Um, and so, and, and I'm, I've, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to that and compassionate to that. And I think you, I mean, for me, I haven't heard this, um, but it's really resonating with me now that it's, it's so due to this notion of individualism, right? Um, that everything is um, some kind of a, a verdict on who we are as an individual. Um, and that it's not like, you can have that in your past. And I'm not saying you're a bad person or that is you, but we are a part of this fabric, right? And you can't pull that thread out, you know, and, and have it exist individually. So, so in the work that you're doing, like, how do you, how do you encourage or help encourage people to have conversations that are honest, um, but not so individualist? <laughs> so that one's easy for me. And I think it's easy for me because I'm a Christian. Um, and, and somebody who takes the Bible pretty seriously. And the Bible wasn't written for individuals. It wasn't written about individuals. It was written for the sake of creating community. It was written for the sake of a people thriving um, and doing right by each other. And what I think is fascinating, and yes, I'm not apologizing for it. Uh, <laughs> I firmly believe that, again, that toxic sludge of individualism that really uh, grows in, in this country in particular has caused us to misread the Bible, um, which very infrequently uses you singular or, um, or I singular. It's almost always to the you plural um, and the we, um, the first person plural. Um, and what's interesting is so many of the stories of our ancestors can point us to solidarity. I had the wildest conversation over, do I have time for a wild conversation I had over lunch? So I'm writing my book right now. I've got about four days to finish it. Y'all pray for me. Um, I decided to treat myself to lunch, um, looking out on the water. It's gorgeous. And then local guy decides that he thinks I'm cute and he's going to sit down next to me and talk to me. Um, and unfortunately asks me what I do and I'm not good enough at lying. And so I try to avoid it. I'm like, you know, I just do contract work. Um, and he says, what kind, what kind of contract work? And I said, All right, I do anti-racism. And he's like, good for you. It's so important. I've never understood why people could think badly about people based on race and why they used to have different water fountains. And the fact that they're doing it to white people now, it's really important. I'm like, oh, we're, huh. Okay. And I was like, and he says, you know, there are kids today who are getting sent to school and being taught to be ashamed of being uh, of themselves because they're white. And I was like, so have you read any of the curriculums? He's like, I study this stuff all the time. And I'm like, but have you read the curriculums? Uh, and he's like, I don't understand. And I was like, so, so let me... and despite the fact that I'm supposed to be on break, I say, so here's the thing. The same people who hurt enslaved people, the same people who hurt immigrants, almost every single one of them also hurt poor white people. And he's like, that is what we need to talk about. Poor white people got hurt. And I'm like, that's not really my point, but let's talk about Bacon's Rebellion. And I said, by 1676, um, which is when Bacon's Rebellion happened, because this is what happens if you try to flirt with me at lunch, men, I'm just letting you know. The girls might get away with it, the men do not. Okay, so 1676, um, the people who own the land um, have decided they wanna wipe out all the indigenous people in the area. They send out the white indentured servants and the black enslaved folks to do this. And I said to the guy, by 1676, 
these white indentured servants and these black enslaved folks have already been trained to believe that indigenous people are savages who can't take care of the land anyhow, and they don't really matter. So they go out and well, and also they have to because the people who are in charge of their lives have told them to. They go out, they kill the indigenous people. But while they're out there together, they realize, hey, you know who else life sucks? Us. And they turn on the landowners because they realize they have common cause. These indentured white folks and these enslaved black folks come together, rise up against their oppressors. And their oppressors think, oh, this is not what we meant to have happen. And this is when the science of the pseudoscience of race begins to take hold. So I'm telling them about this and I'm like, here's the thing. This is the point in time where the people who actually have all the stuff can say to poor white folks, hey, you may not have much, but at least you're better than those people. And that's what has kept these systems in place for all these years. And I think what's important about that is if we look, but, but also we don't get taught about Bacon's rebellion. We don't get taught about black and white coal miners coming together to strike. We don't get taught about Chinese uh, uh, railroad workers organizing the largest ever labor strike. We don't talk about indigenous folks and black folks coming together um, in certain places and acts of resistance. We don't get taught about the times that we showed up for ourselves and each other because then we wouldn't be normal. Then we would be learning how to be disruptive. Then we would be a threat. And he's like, that's right. Those things did happen. And I was like, and you know what stories we're getting now? We're getting the stories about Elon Musk and about Jeffrey Bezos. And we're getting stories of heroes who have billions of dollars when they don't pay their workers enough to, to be able to thrive. I said, the stories are the same ones now that the plantation owners were trying to sell us 400 years ago. And I think part of what's important about doing this work around ancestry is it connects us to those sacred stories in the Bible and it connects us to the ways that we are able to be in solidarity with each other. It's true, the stories of our ancestors can show how they survived horrors so we can survive them too, but they did more than just survive. They resisted, they created alternatives. They built things that were beautiful that had to be torn apart because they were such a threat to the people with all the power. If that's not a biblical story, I don't know what is. And I think that's some of what ancestor stories can offer us. But you're saying you didn't get his number. No. All right. Dude was 70 years old. He made sure to let me know he had a 40 year girlfriend. So I, for, at one point, so I could I could be aware of the fact that he wasn't too old for me. Oh, <laughs> um, I get. Uh, so here, here, this is a um, uh, it's a personal question. It's a very selfish question. Uh, I'm not asking this on behalf of Charlene or anybody else. Um, and uh, uh, related to our conclusions we just made about um, how toxic individualism is, um, uh, that we part of that if that toxicity is that we as uh, we reserve the right to like have an opinion about everything as individuals, right? Just everything, you know, everything deserves or demands like our opinion. You know, it's cool, not cool, awesome, not awesome, you know, rad, if you still say rad, um, uh, toxic, not toxic, exhausting, not exhausting, you know, um, memorable, mm, or uh, how about this, like interesting, you know, uh, that's, one, that's one I hear a lot now is uh, things are interesting or not interesting. So, uh, Relieving, I think, relieving ourselves of this uh, uh, this construct of individualism will also mean letting go of our like this demand that we've got that we have an opinion or we get to have an opinion and that everything deserves our opinion, including our ancestors. So this must this is just me right here, right? 
Um, not Charlene, I'm just gonna say that one more time. So how do we rediscover or just discover for the first time our ancestors without feeling compelled to call them good or bad people? How do we do that without like immediately determining whether or not like we sh like what our opinion is about them? Because the minute we start forming an opinion, then we actually begin to shape the narrative that we're telling ourselves, right? So, and so I, we, we take it in, you yeah. know, we take in, we immediately begin taking in the information that yeah. um, uh, aligns with our opinion and we leave the rest yeah. out. So that's my question. I love this question because I, I think I had said earlier on the stories we tell our, we are told about our ancestors tell us a lot about who we're supposed to be. The values we place on our ancestors tell us a lot about who we think we should be. And so I think wrapped up in all of that is this sense of clarity of who we are, as if we have the right to say, but I'm a good person. And that happens all the time in these conversations. You can't tell me I'm racist because I'm a good person. Um, or, you know, you can't, you, whatever it is, right? Um, and so the, that ability to evaluate others is wrapped up in who we understand ourselves to be or what we should be. And so I wonder if the starting place for that is giving ourselves permission to let God be the arbiter of that rather than ourselves about ourselves first. Amen. So that we can open ourselves up to that possibility. I have a co-trainer uh, in the anti-racism work I do, Dave Bell, who, and he makes me cringe every time he says this because it makes me do my own work. He says, Listen, I'm telling you this history of the doctrine of discovery because my ancestors participated in it. We did harm. And, and the fact that I'm saying that doesn't mean they weren't trying their best. And he said, I hope 50 years from now, somebody's looking back and saying that Dave Bell, man, he may have been trying, but he sure was a racist. He's like, because I am trying. I'm trying to get it better than the ones before me. And I'll be real sad if my kids don't do better than I did. So what happens if we actually give ourselves permission not to be the final judges about ourselves? Does that open us up? I wonder, I'm asking you back this question. Does that open us up to seeing our ancestors differently? Charlene, what you think? I mean, Amos, you're the one who asked that great question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, um, uh, yeah, to like give yourself the grace to like be, to, to live as if you're disattached, you know, from like any particular outcome or conclusion, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm a good person, I'm trying to stay good, you know, or I'm a bad person and I'm not redeemable, so I might as well just kind of keep on being bad, whatever that means. That would be, that's, that's to, I mean, I, I would say that's sort of the definition of like resurrection, you know, is that you're, you, you have, you've, you have died to, um, to this world, you know, which is demanding, like it's demanding that we actually make those conclusions that we put each other into the categories and put ourselves into those categories. Um, and uh, yeah, and I mean, so I mean, that's the work of, that's the work of like discipleship, I think, you know. But we also have some spiritual ancestors, all of us, um, even if we don't want to claim them, who did think they were arbiters of what was good or bad. Um, God bless John Calvin. But like you said something and I was like, whoa, John Calvin said that. Uh, you know, there was Wait, I said something John Calvin said. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I, I don't think you were saying it was a good thing, but you were talking about this this notion of like, um, I'm a good person trying to stay good, or I'm a bad person trying to be good. Um, I mean, there's some pre, there's there's some stuff there that overlaps with this oh, notion sure. of predestinarianism, right? Yep. Um, yeah, which means that it's countercultural just for us to say, maybe I can't say. Yeah. But to call to call yourself good, you know, or call yourself bad, right, is actually you you are you're resisting 
the work of transformation and like reformation. Um, and, um, and you're, I mean, you are, you're dead to the movements of the Holy Spirit at that point, right? If you're, if you think you're done and God is done with you in this world, then you might as well be dead as I understand it, the way the gospel talks to me. But, um, but I, I think it's, um, it's gonna like right now, for instance, this is my, my, um, what I hear is that like white is bad. Black is good. People, right. Just on this most basic level. All right. And this, I hear this from, um, uh, a lot of like, I hear my, more progressive minded friends, you know, um, speak in these kind of constructs, right? To where it, they, they, there's something angelic about being a person of color, you know, and there is something devilish about being white at this time in history, period. Like that's how we begin when we relate with each other, or we hear stories or it's how we interpret the news. And so it's, it's not just a matter of like, making judgments on our ancestors but the that is the, what, what, the way in which we judge ancestors is just reflective of the way in which we're just judging like each other at this particular point in history that's just me anecdotal got nothing no kind of like research to back that up i'm done but it's i mean in all of these things it centers i mean and this is something that i've known to be true and yet Shonda, you entering into this conversation is pretty profound for me. It still centers the individual, right? And even what if us being me, being a good person or a bad person is actually not the point. I mean, like uh, there's this thing that I want to say that is both the most offensive thing I could say to an individual and perhaps the most beautiful thing. It's not about you, right? Um, and that is the paradox of faith, because we have this God, this savior who loves Jesus, loves me so much that Jesus wants me to love everyone else more than I love myself. Like, how does that make sense? Right. And so in all of these conversations, it's either you know, the oppression Olympics or who's bad or who's good. And it's, it continues to center on the individual. I mean, growing up um, and for, I, I'm, you know, I, I think it's safe to say for both of you culturally, you know, Korean, the Korean culture traditionally is a collectivist society, right? Um, and so everything you do bears judgment upon your family name. It's not about your like, like Charlene Han's legacy. It's what's the, what does this do to the Han family name? Right. And so um, you don't store up individual wins or losses. Everything is held by the collective, um, which I, I mean, again, Shonda, you say that it's just like, oh my goodness, we are playing this game that doesn't even exist. If we actually claim to be, a, you know, God's people, a communal people where scripture, like how many attaboys did Jesus hand out? You are such a good boy, Peter. Never, not a once. Thanks for being a good guy, Peter. Jesus was totally an Asian auntie. Like there's no way to be around it. Like I, I ride hard for Jesus was black, but like when you read some of that stuff, Jesus was an Asian auntie. There's no question about it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. This conversation's messing in my head for sure. In in a good way. I just it is, it is it, the, I think the, the, the nature of the discourse that is happening that where everyone ends up feeling a bit disillusioned or disenfranchised, regardless of color or, you know, economic status, all that stuff is because I think we're just, we're on a, we're on a toxic loop. And so how do we get out of it where we're just like, okay, so what is the, what is, how do we honor our family name? And one of the things that I found the most beautiful about this whole project, I told you the first third is about biological ancestors and that's where it stays messy. It just is messy. Um, 
Some of it is we got to dig because there are stories about amazing ancestors we were never told. We got to dig because there were stories about suffering we were never told. And we got to dig because there were stories about harm that were never told. Um, or if we've unearthed them, we've been encouraged not to process them, which is what intergenerational trauma is, right? I'm not going to go down that road because we've done an awful lot of, wow, this is hard already. Um, the second third of my book is about cultural ancestors, spiritual ancestors, and movement ancestors. For those of us who feel marginalized even within our communities, and that can be white people, that can be people of color, um, I got a chance to do a research project uh, a year ago where I delved into the stories of queer South Asian immigrants as an ancestor project. Um, Cause I, it's only about five years ago I came into an identity um, as, as a queer person. So I don't have a lot of history with it or a self understanding about it. And doing this research, I discovered the only reason we know about South Asian queer immigrants is because of their prison records because their existence was deemed a crime or at least their actions were deemed a crime. And very often because there was a narrative of the devious, dangerous, corrupting influence of not masculine, but also brutish, harsh Asian men, South Asian men, um, taking advantage of these poor, vulnerable, young, innocent white men the ones who ended up in prison were the South Asian men. But in the course of doing that research, I discovered, oh, I've got a different lineage. One that my family's never going to talk about. One that my church is still squeamish about. But I've got a lineage of people who went through some stuff that I don't have to go through because of all the things they did and all the ways they came together over time to change things. That's a huge gift. And so I think one of the interesting and beautiful gifts of cultural, spiritual, and movement ancestors is even when the stories of our family can be beautiful and also complicated, We've got families that have been divinely created for us. And we've got ancestors who may not be blood ancestors, but the fact of the matter is the expression isn't blood is thicker than water. The expression originally was actually the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Our non-biological spiritual connections are much deeper than our biological ones. So I think recognizing how big the community of ancestors is, and in the church, we more traditionally call it the communion of saints, um, gives us an awful lot of encouragement and support to be brave and to be faithful. And I think being faithful is more important than focusing on being good. Uh, and I think that's what it opens up for us in some amazing ways. You give me courage. I um, I sleep better at night knowing that you are in this world. Um, the, the conversations you are inspiring, hosting, encouraging, challenging, the corner of the work that you are um, occupying is, is so meaningful. Um, and so I cannot wait for your book to come out. Uh, First Pres Berkeley and Dallas folks, just get ready. Mental shopping cart, put that book in your shopping cart um, right next to things that are going to feed your soul, um, but challenge you a bit. And so not, not a bit, challenge you a lot. Um, let's be honest, right? Uh, okay. Final question for you, Shonda. What my sincere hope, if I have hope for anything, is that we've got some young people who are tuning into this conversation. 
So Ancestor Shonda, what is your word, your hope, your benediction for the generations to come? Sometimes the people we're with right now are too much. And that's the time that we get to turn to ancestors to remember that we're not alone. Mm. Yeah. That's so beautiful. I just got to confess that one of the things that I've just been struggling with as, um, I don't know if it's pandemic, I don't know. It's, um, and I, and I, it has literally become come up in so many conversations. So I don't think I'm alone in this is the concept of loneliness. Yeah. And you just said, we have friends, we have confidants, we have people who see us um, in our ancestors. And that's, that's just a really beautiful image to imagine. Um, thank you for that kind of hopeful. Ugh, my heart is full. It's <laughs> challenged and full. Amos? Got nothing else. Let's end it. Let's uh, think that's an appropriate place to, to, to say good night. And thank you, thank folks. You. We will be um, here in this weird virtual space, March 22nd, I believe, for our um, next This Is Crucial conversation. Um, we've got exciting stuff in the works for the coming months, um, exciting guests, and uh, um, as I was in Dallas in January, Amos is heading west in May. And so just keep, uh, stay tuned on, on some exciting announcements up ahead. Shonda, we love you. We are grateful for you. Friends, blessings on your Lent journey as we head in that direction starting this Wednesday. Thank Shonda, you. thank you.